was sure I'd split my head wide open and crack my ribs. So I'm just lying there for about 10 minutes in the rain. I didn't even want to get up. And this is five days before I left for New Zealand. So uh, I went to a friend of mine who's a doctor, and he checked me out. He said, I don't think it's broken. He couldn't find any holes in my head, which is nice. Uh, it still hurt. And then he said, even if it was cracked, we can't do very much. We could, you know, strap it up. And I thought, well, if I crack ribs, I can sit there and do those eight hours looking like 16 hours a day just sitting talking. So the only weird thing is I started hiccuping. And that is very weird. You know, usually if you want to stop hiccups, there's various ways you can do it. You know, use sugar and stuff. It'll go, boo, you know, and then people forget, and there's all these different ways to stop hiccuping. But uh, everything I tried, the sugar thing, the boo thing, nothing stopped. I just kept hiccup about every 30 seconds, <laughs> like that. And I had to speak at a Bible college for three hours before, and I'm going, hello, I want to talk to you about wit witnessing. It was very bad. A lot of editing was needed at the end of that thing. But... Uh, it still hurt a bit, and so we were getting ready, and a, another friend of mine, an older man who's ministered a great deal on healing in New Zealand, was having a meeting just five minutes down the road. So I thought, we'll go down and see him. And my wife had been busy painting a trailer that we have here in the US when we come over, and she'd, she'd worked so hard on it, it sort of stuffed her arm, and it was really stiff, and she could hardly lift it up. And so at the end of the healing meeting, we sneaked up to a friend and asked if we could get some prayer. And so I came up too for, you know, whatever the hiccup thing was. Feel bad. Could you pray for me? I'm hiccuping. You know, it doesn't have the ring of I have cancer or something. You know, it's just <laughs> hiccuping. So anyway, we went up, and this man uh, prayed for faith. Her arm was great. We tried it out again today in tennis. It was really good. But uh, right at the end of this very short prayer, he said, do not be, don't worry, he said something like this, don't worry about the massive bills. W what massive bills? <laughs> you know, sometimes prophets can get it wrong, you know. Really bad in the Bible if you're a prophet and you get it wrong because everybody knows you're a false prophet and they're not going to listen to you anymore. But when a friend is praying like this and he's saying, Don't be concerned about the huge bills because God will take care of it, you know, just like that. Trust Him, lean on Him. So when we went home, it was five minutes away, uh, we thought, What was he talking about? We actually said to him, Actually, we don't have any huge bills. I don't have a television program, I want to apologize for that. <laughs> or even a radio program, I'd apologize for that too. Uh, well, I don't even have a secretary. I did have one, and then Barry Maguire got saved and he married her, so that's it, you know. It's, I didn't have a secretary. I, I do have email, and uh, I get up to a thousand letters a day, and that's embarrassing because I can't, and I am on Facebook, but nobody, as I said, can have. 15,000 close friends, you know, it's just stupid. I'm not even going to look at Facebook again unless I'm forced to. But So in the middle of all of this, I got ready to go to Korea. On the way over, it's quite a long trip, it's about a 14-hour trip, a brief stop over in Australia. I started feeling strange on, on that short trip, three-hour trip from uh, Auckland to Sydney. And I was staying at the Qantas lounge there for about an hour and a half or two hours before the next leg of the trip. And I just, it's not weird for me to feel strange. Uh, I feel strange pretty much all the time. And uh, I've been through midlife crisis about every two weeks, so it, it's kind of all right to feel strange and have midlife crises and things. But there's a, a strange kind, because there's still a soreness there and still the hiccuping. But the strangeness was weird. It was just like things weren't quite together. So I'd been sitting there in that lounge for about an hour. It's so about half an hour before the next part went on. And I said to the lady, I said, how far away is the gate? She said, it's quite a long way. It's about a quarter of a mile. <laughs> quarter, quarter of a mile. I said, I 
I'm, I'm, I just told her, I'm feeling a little bit weird. She said, well, we'll get, we'll get you a wheelchair. I have never had a wheelchair. I thought it'd be a kind of a cool thing. I tried one in Disneyland and they pushed me around for a while. So they, they put me in a wheelchair and I just, you know, I felt great, you know, being wheeled in and, and uh, got onto the plane to fly to Korea for the longest part of the trip, feeling weird the entire time. But when they arrange a, a wheelchair for you on one end, they arrange for one on the other side. So when I arrived in Korea, still feeling weird, they brought a wheelchair up and wheeled me that long distance to the, to the exit gates. And, and, and the poor a lady who had come to pick me up sees me being wheeled. <laughs> she, she said, what happened to you? I, I said, I don't know. And so they, it's about an hour trip from the, from the Seoul uh, airport to where we were going. And I was supposed to have that night free, meet with a few of the leaders and put the things together, have supper with them and stuff. I had a whole day off the following day and then these four intensive days that are like a month jammed into one. So on the way, still feeling weird, I said, listen, is there any clinic or something I could get a checkup? I thought I'd get a check tonight. Uh, if there's anything funny, then uh, if, it, if this broken thing really was broken, uh, at least I'd find out early, and I have a whole day to maybe get it fixed up. And she called one of the deacons in the church that was hosting this uh, seminar uh, was uh, an, an expert surgeon and a doctor. He's, how many of you know what House is? The movie, you know, the television series House? Okay, this guy was like House, and he was nice. You know, he's brilliant, brilliant guy, and there is, a, in the Incheon province, there is a, eight, I think it's eight stories high training hospital. And they have the top uh, professors of different things. And he was over cardiac. And that was his, you know, so there's 2,000 young Korean students that are doing this. And uh, so he checked me in to the hotel for a checkup. And they found that an old hernia, I mentioned to you that thing last night, those of you who were here, that ripped hernia that happened when I was small, I've had them a number of times, and there was an old one that had been ripped twice. And I thought, oh, I can't keep going to the hospital all the time, I'll just play tennis and stay skinny and it should be all right. But it had begun to swell, and you can die on a, on a hernia that strangulates. So I was off the plane, and they checked it, and they, they diagnosed, they said it's swelling, and it's, this is probably the problem. And so they promptly put me in surgery. The other cool thing, when I got checked in by this, it's n nothing is cool here, but I'm just sharing the coolness of what wasn't cool. <laughs> the other cool thing is that the pastor who was hosting it, his brother was one of the top uh, insurance guys in that whole province. And he wrote me an insurance policy when I checked in. Now, how often does that happen? And it was 50% off whatever the cost of is of something, which is more than most people would even expect in a thing. And this is before I've even been checked. I get this, and it's a special kind of policy. It's like visiting dignitary thing. You know, if I was Billy Graham or the president or something and I fell down some stairs or something, then, you know, I could get cover this policy. So I'm in there. Well, anyway, they found it and uh, fixed it up, put a, uh, put a sort of a mesh around it so that it wouldn't fall apart again. And then I, you know, I came out of it. When my wife found out that I was in hospital, she said, you know, she's going to fly over. I said, don't worry, I'll get a whole day to recover. I'll just sit there and I'll teach from a chair for the, next, uh, for the rest of the time in Korea. But they kept testing the, the blood. And after this thing was finished, my uh, infection level kept rising. And I realized there's something else that we missed. Korea when they do these things, they do little tiny incisions and, and low. If it had been a bit higher, they may have seen what had happened because what that fall had done, it had belted my, my colon, a transverse colon, it had belted it like that, and 
it actually flipped like that and then uh, jammed like this. And so it had begun to swell high and then blew and infected. And my whole body was being poisoned. So I was dying of toxic shock. And so they didn't find this out until they ripped me from just under the breastbone to below the belly button and opened it up and saw this whole area that had been damaged. And they did some very fast surgery and they did a nice job. They, they didn't, you know, just cut everything. They found the parts that they thought were going blue and put a little Mebius twist in it so it would fit well. And, uh, but they only gave me 10% chance to live in that thing. The infection was so bad. So they sewed me up and they kept watching and they thought it was over, but it wasn't over. And so they opened me up again and they brought in, you see, they knew it was my first trip and they knew there were a whole bunch of pastors and leaders coming to this thing and I was treated like a real dignitary. And in this hospital it's like, you are not going to die in our hospital, you know. <laughs> you will not die on our watch. So they brought in the, uh, the state of the art machinery, all that stuff. They gave me everything they had and they brought in the very best bowel surgeon they knew. And I don't know how long that lady worked on this problem. But they found that the entire bowel had perforated in all kinds of different places. And it was so small, it's just poison sifting out. And so after the 10% chance of living and being sewed up and then still the poison going through, I really should have died. And she was working, we don't know when she started, sometime in the afternoon, it may have been two or three in the afternoon. She's still working at one or two in the morning. And so finally my wife arrived with a good friend and he asked her, he said, because uh, I pulled through, I didn't die, but I was in a coma then, a medically induced coma, and I, wouldn't, I didn't come out of it. So I stayed in for, I don't know, seemed like two and a half weeks in that coma. But in it, it was just like this. It was as real as this, you know. Uh, I slept and ate and talked to people and did all kinds of things. And it wasn't in Korea and it wasn't in America and it wasn't in New Zealand or Australia. It was in London. Very unusual situation. I won't uh, tell you all the scary things that I saw <laughs> in those two and a half weeks there, but all I remember is that this, they asked her, uh, what happened? She said it, there was so much damage. It's like being shot in the stomach with a shotgun. There was so much damage then, they're tiny. I don't know how she, she was trying to seal them. Like, you know, microscopes, sh sh all these little dots. There was so much damage, she said, I, I was going to give up. It was impossible to fix. I was just going to quit and I would have died. And then he said, well, what happened? She said, I felt a presence behind me and I couldn't stop, I just kept working. And it sealed, see that? And he asked her, are you a Christian? She said, no, but I prayed for this man. <laughs> so isn't that lovely, the, the dealings of God and a thing, see that? So it's quite an amazing, amazing thing. And I wanted to pass on to you what happened when I did die. Um, in that long time, I saw some very strange things. I saw stuff that I've never seen before. Um, so people asked me, when you were dying in that coma, and when you did die, and I did, did you go to heaven? And I'd tell them no, and that didn't surprise some of them. They knew I wasn't going to go to heaven anyway. <laughs> And then some of them said, did you go to hell? And they expected me to go, yes, I did go to hell. You deserved it too, you blighted. <laughs> but uh, they asked me, did you see an angel? And, you know, I, all the answers to those were no, I didn't see any of those things. And they said, well, did you see Jesus? And I said, no. And they said, well, what, what did you see? You know, what, what happened to you in that thing? So I can't tell you all of the strangeness of the only way I could show somebody what happened in that coma was like doing a second Blade Runner movie with 
Scott Ridley. It was an unusual, amazing thing. Some very scary things and some things I've n never seen before, even dreamed of. You know when Ezekiel saw the wheel and uh, he, he could describe it, but he didn't know what he saw. That's what happened, a bunch of these things. Um, I saw equations where I recognized a few of them, but not the rest. Artificial intelligence equations, all kinds of strange things happening in there. Um, but in the end of this, here's what, it, what happened. I realized right near the end of the time that I was dying. Even though it's calm aware that there's no pain or anything else, I realized right near the end I'm going to die. You can tell it because when you hear people sharpening knives, like this, and then you hear dialogue that goes like this, somebody's going to die tonight, you get the idea that it may be you. And suddenly, I was in a room, and it was an empty room, and it was huge. It didn't have any doors, and it didn't have any windows. It had no furniture and no carpets, but it was white, not shining, just a pure white room. And I was standing in real life. I was strapped down uh, with about 30-something drips, and uh, my body had doubled in size. I looked like uh, a Michelin man. There was no space between my fingers. And there were all of these pipes and things going in, and I was strapped down. I could not even get up in any way. I had to be lifted up, and it took about five minutes to get me up. So I'm basically there like this with pipes and all kinds of things on me. But now I'm out of emergency and I'm just, they, they can't get me out. So they just, I'm just there. Not even being monitored for death or anything, just there. And there I'm suddenly in this white room. And it, so I'm looking at the wall in front of me and that's what I think. Maybe now the wall opens up. And angel start, oh, they singing in the back, you know, and then you see sort of this, like, the tunnel, you know, there's all these different things people say when you die, this is what you see. So I'm looking for the wall to open up and a tunnel, at least one angel around going high or something, but then there's no open door, there's no angels, it's just a, a wall. So I'm, I thought, well, Maybe the Lord's down there. I'm looking for, there's always an exit. You know, there it is, right there. See, exit, big sign, sometimes red. This is the one going to heaven. The red one's usually to hell, Ex <laughs> exit. So I'm looking for the, ex there's got to be a door here somewhere, but I'm standing, see that? And looking down there, and then suddenly I realize I am not breathing. I'm not breathing. And it is a weird thing to suddenly not be able to breathe. It's like being drowned, except there's no water. And many of us think that the real thing that kills you is your heart. A lot of people die of heart attacks. Maybe the brain or other things. I don't think it's any of those. I think it's the one more basic even than water. It's air. It's oxygen. See, when God makes us, he creates us, directly. It's not a mediate creation like in talking to the waters and the earth and that. He makes us personally. We are the crown of his creation. And the thing that is amazing about that, I don't know what that process looked like. Like he's like rolling bits of, you know, pulling things out. <laughs> I love it when the disciples are going past and there's a blind guy and all, every day is like Stevie Wonder, he's, you know, singing, hoping somebody will give him something and and uh, the disciples in their genius, bless their hearts, you know, <laughs> Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And what a dumb question that is. You could say, well, it was his parents, you know. Parents screwed up, that's why he's born blind. Or, or you know, in another lifetime, he was... <laughs> Stupid thing. Jesus said, neither. Is a good answer? <laughs> neither. And then he said, I must work the works of him that sent me. While well, it is day, night comes when no one has worked. That's one of my two lifetime verses. 
But then he does something weird. Now, when, you, when you're blind and you've never seen anything, you're sitting there. Some people called for arms, but they really needed eyes. Arms, arms, arms. <laughs> but he's there, and he's like this. You hear people going past and stuff. Yeah? And then you hear this. It means somebody spat right beside you. You think somebody, I hate it. There's one of those, those blind beggars. So he's, he's wondering what this is. And then it gets weirder. Somebody spat on the dirt like this. And it gets worse. Somebody sticks mud in your eyes and starts sticking it in the eye sockets like this. Now this is against American Medical Society. <laughs> if you ask, what is the feasibility of passing this? So anyway, he's lying there with mud in his eyes, okay? And then he hears a voice, go to the pool of Salaam and wash. Well, you know, when you've got mud in your eyes, you're going to go someplace. So he heads off there. <laughs> he doesn't know who in the fat spat in my eye. And where's the pool of Salaam? At least I've been there sometimes. He washes his eyes, and then he can see. Well, the result of that is in a half hour, he breaks a church in half because people see him and he goes I can see and they go well you look like that guy that was blind yeah I am that guy that was blind well how can you see I don't know a man called Jesus spat on the ground put dirt in my eyes and told me to wash and I didn't I could see and I said well how, how did he do that I don't know he spat and then he, he said you know you've got a pretty short testimony when you've only been <laughs> seeing for 30 minutes you can't give them a complete e exegesis on various forms of application of mud and stuff. You don't know anything. You're just telling them. And they're so ticked. They say, well, it can't be Jesus because he, he, we know that guy. He's a sinner. You know, he, he couldn't have done anything like that. And then someone said, well, maybe it really was him. And the church splits up in half because of him. They ask his parents, is this your kid? Yes. Was he born blind? Yes. Well, how can he see? Well, uh, you know, we don't know. Ask him. He was blind. He wasn't deaf or dumb. Talk to him. Ask him. <laughs> but you know what was cool about that? The only time in the Bible when God touched clay other than that was when he made us. And I think Jesus rolled him some new eyeballs. And he just put them in. Go and wash. And he washed and he came seeing. And it's kind of cool because he's looking, he's never seen before. You know what it's like to see for the very first time? And he's trying to find the place that he used to feel out, you know. And he's kicked out of the church. He's just sitting there on his own. And the person comes up and he says, do you believe in the Son of God? And he goes, who is he? He just words, you have both seen him and he it is that's talking with you so when God finishes making us this is what he does and he breathes into mankind's nostrils the breath of life and he becomes a living soul that's how you get life that God breathes and it's the same word the pneuma word the would we use for the work of the Holy Spirit, that breath that goes in. So I believe that when you die, that breath goes. And when Jesus died on the cross, though they call it in the Bible a stroke, it wasn't uh, an aneurysm like I had in 2009. It wasn't a heart attack. He stopped breathing. And the Bible says he gave up the ghost, his last breath. So my thesis is that real death comes when your body no longer carries oxygen and you can't get it in any other way. And that's what happened to me.
to, to suddenly find yourself standing, but with one breath left, the one you've got now. Now, Harry Houdini used to be able to be buried in a, in a coffin and kept there for like two days and still came out. And he did it. It would be awful if you screwed up. Oh, people forgot. I don't know, where's Harry? We buried him somewhere. And like five days later, you find what was left of Harry. But what he did is he controlled his breathing to tiny little, like, you, if you hear him, like, like that. Did that for him. And extended the time you should be able to. Now, if you were in a coffin and all closed down, you go, oh, I'm in a coffin, then you're going to die very fast. See, so... I tried standing there, realized that this is the last breath I've got. I can't breathe in anymore. So I tried to control my breathing out. <laughs> but you only got a very short time with that. And then suddenly I can't breathe out anymore. I can't breathe in anymore. But I am still standing. But I have no no, no things stuck into me. I didn't even know about that. And I'm standing up in the white room. And I thought, Jesus is probably down there somewhere. And I look, and I can't see any Jesus at all. Nobody's saying, hi, Wink, or something down there. And I thought, he's going to probably sneak up behind me. You know, when I'm looking around, you hi. You know. <laughs> So I thought I'll, I'll turn fast and I'll see him as he's reaching out, you know, like this. But I'm not an owl. I can't do the rotating head thing and look backwards. So I've got to turn like this. So I turned as fast as I could and he wasn't behind me. So I thought, well, he's not in front of me. All this is without breathing and he's not down there and he's not behind me, then where is he? Can't tell you how long I was in that. All I know is this, that there was no fear at all and no pain, but no breath. And the best way I can describe this is an eye blink. Now, I want you to blink as fast as you can. Fast as you can. If it, it's like a flicker, isn't it? A hundredth of a second is a fast blink. And you had an American swimmer in an Olympic competition some years ago who won a record eight gold medals in his swimming. Do you remember this man? He won by a hundredth of a second. And the only way they figured that out is the French swimmer he was swimming against. He actually changed his normal rules. He stretched out a tiny little bit, not knowing where the other guy was, and his finger touched a hundredth of a second before the French guy did, and he won another gold medal. A hundredth of a second made the difference between an astonishing win and a second. All I can tell you is that it felt like a blink, but it wasn't a blink. I suddenly realized I'm looking out of his eyes and he's looking through mine. He wasn't outside me. He was inside me. And I thought, he's inside me. And then in real time in the hospital, two, three, sometime in the morning, there's nobody there, I'm alone. I go, <laughs> and I come back to life again. I'm, I'm sitting up looking around. I thought I was only gone for like a day or something. And then when the doctors came in, probably seven, just this Christian guy that had, though he's on another floor, he brought his team up to check on him. And then they go, ah! you know, and they're all running, <laughs> running all over. I'm just sitting looking around, oh, you know. <laughs> and they're looking for Faye and William are over in the young doctor's thing. They found one single room out of 2,000 things that was still open. They put them there. So there was only about a five-minute walk away from the hospital. And they could be there every day. And about eight-something, they got him over. And they wanted um, 
them to talk to me, because most of them didn't speak English at all, to see if there was anything left or if, you know, what I'd forgotten or anything else. But that's, that's what it's like for me to die. And so, in the making of man and all of these things, the final time in that hospital, I was in there two months, longest than any other person had ever been in that hospital. We had major cancer patients that left before me. So I want you to think about this when we're talking about the provision of God. That strange little statement that that friend made that we thought was so weird, why? I don't even have a secretary to pay. We pay our bills, you know, water bills, phone bills and stuff. But we don't have some huge, massive thing, you know. That bill was about thirty to $35,000 a week, sometimes less, sometimes more. And here's the weird thing. My computer, which has all this, you know, friends, addresses, stuff, William was playing with it, something, when I, you know, before, before I came out of this, and he turned it off instead of just shutting the thing, and he couldn't get the password right. So we couldn't even call people we knew for that whole time. He, didn't, he had to go down to a near a Starbucks and find some open deal and send stuff out so the world would know whether I was alive or not, send all that stuff out. But can you imagine what it is like? I didn't, I didn't realize most of this because of the coma thing. To have a thirty to $35,000 bill every single week so you put it together in American terms, there's something like $2 million a bill. And that was that two things happened. One was that, that insurance policy, which was just a miracle, and cut whatever it was in half. Now look, if I had to pay a $2 million bill, see that, if I sold William <laughs> and the house, it still wouldn't pay it. Do you know what I mean? Be working for the rest of your life, short, <laughs> and it'd never be paid. But the weirdest thing was this. Though uh, later friends said, well, why didn't you just call your friends? And tell them? <laughs> I couldn't call anybody. <laughs> I was out of it, see? And I'm the only one working in our family. And my wife's, uh, she's been a nurse all her life, but, you know, she's taken care of me. And then, my son's awesome, and he's working, worked for YWAM for five solid years doing their um, audio and video stuff. And then he gave up what he was doing to come and help me. And so I'm the breadwinner, and I'm dead. And <laughs> 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 there's these huge bills. The thing I wanted to say this to you is that every single week that had to be paid, and every single week, the money came in without telling people every single week. That is called a miracle. Some of my friends sent huge amounts. They heard. Remember I'm getting prayed for about 10,000 people a day during that critical time when I was in that coma. Every single day money came in. Sometimes a widow's mite would come in. But we walked out two months later, not owing a single cent in that hospital thing. Isn't that amazing? And the thing that's so cool about it is Faye remembered. You, you imagine like this, you know, you're the mother and the wife, and suddenly you get a small inkling of how much it's going to cost. It can become utterly overwhelming to a point of this can never be paid, giving up. She said I could constantly remember the face of Bill Sabritsky telling us this prophecy. Don't worry about these things. So he said all I had was to trust God. That's all I could do. So all our lives we've learned to do that. And this was the biggest one of all. And the great miracle is that I survived that death. And that also a huge miracle is that it got paid for. So isn't that cool? All right. Now, you're, you're a morning crowd, so you don't need huge anointings and 400 
understandings, but I'm going to give you a very simple thing. I don't know how long I've got. See, I'm, I ask people like Peter, how long can I speak? And I say, you can speak as long as you like, but everybody will leave at 11.30. So <laughs> what I want to do is you give you a very fast little lesson on, on what I call uh, the laws of the free lunch. This is a good thing to know in America <laughs> right now. This is, uh, and if you've got Bibles, it's not, you know what I like? I don't like being in the dark. I hate, this is nice, but you guys, I can't even see you when the lights go off, you know? If I gave an invitation, I wouldn't know whether you came or you ran away. It's just the front line, I'd know if you responded. <laughs> But all the backsliders who hide at the back, I don't know what would happen to them. They're gone, see? So, so I want to give you this fast, but here's the passages. Oh, it's flying through on its own. Mark 6, 34 to 44, and Mark 8, 1 to 21. Uh, originally, the original structure of this was done by that great master preacher. He's been called the prodigal uh, size preacher because C.H. Spurgeon began to preach when he was 17 years old. And I have his complete library, which is 80 volumes of things as part of the revival library. The print is like point two type, and there's about 600 to 700 pages in each volume. It's 40 foot. There's 80 volumes of this called the Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit. So any of you, you know, a bit bored and you want to read something on the toilet, get Spurgeon's set. And a big toilet, because it was a lot of stuff. Embarrassing thing about the Spurgeon, that he, he'd go off to the Riviera and he'd like swim and you know, just lie around and for like you know, a week or so, and then he'd come back and write tons of sermons. He's an amazing guy. And uh, one time, uh, his wife heard this noise and he, he was asleep. And it, it was Saturday, and he walked to his study, and she thought, oh, he got up early. And he wrote out a complete message, but he was still asleep. Then he went back, and then, you know, continued his sleep. And then he woke up in the morning, and the message was already there, and it shocked him. Here's the message. He wrote it in his sleep. So every now and then, you'll see some amazing thing that came from another time. I have a number of Spurgeon sermons that I've redone. One of them I did in Detroit. And uh, what I found, I've got a clip on Eminem. Oh, by the way, have any of you ever seen my introduction to the Academy Awards of... Have you seen? <laughs> it is a funny thing. It's called Six Mile. It was a, a take on Eminem's Eight Mile. And that was the reason why is because every year we do an outreach in that area. We have for t over 20-something years. This year is the first time we have not had what we call War Week in Detroit. It's not in Detroit City, but there's a 16-mile strip and six miles, original name. It's, it was called Highland Park, and it was a thing of great beauty in the early days because we're almost opposite the church which hosts this outreach is the first Ford factory. And just outside of that is the first freeway ever built in the United States. So people in Highland Park in the early days, it was a ritzy, beautiful place. But then after a hundred years, the whole factories had moved out into the countryside and that city was left without money. And it began to collapse. And it, is, it became the worst city in America. And David Wilkerson's son, Gary, and my friend Tim Delina went into that as young men and began an outreach with the prostitutes in that area. And then he, he got to this three movie theaters. One of them burned down in a gang war. He got the middle one, and he wound up with like 1,500 ex-neo-Nazi hooker uh, and others that got saved. Can you imagine having a whole amazing thing? And it, it's so bad. I'll just tell you a little bit about how bad it was before I give you this thing. It is so bad that all the fast food places left. They, pizza, hot, 
you know. McDonald's, Colonel Sanders chickened out. They, they're all gone, okay? The only one was left was Wendy's. Because nobody's going to... Wendy's. It's too wussy to rob. But if you went to Wendy's to buy something, the, the glass was this thick, bulletproof glass, and you put your money through a slot, and they sent your hamburger out, and a rota... I mean, it is a scary place. Not even gangs want to be in Six Mile. Eight Mile, which is where Eminem grew up, that's Chevy, see? But they have their own mayors, Chevy mayor, and, and so our eight outreach was around Six Mile, which is worse than Eight Mile. So that funny little thing you saw, and, um, those of you who want to see weirdness, um, I'll, I'll play for you a clip of, of uh, what we call Six Mile, but I won't do it right now just say that I have uh, one of Eminem's uh, songs called Cleaning Out My Closet and it's quite a powerful thing. I've edited it for those of you who are saved uh, <laughs> to take the uh, Little John elements out of it uh, but it's really uh, Eminem's speaking against his mother who should have taken care of him. And his two parts, one is he's in a church, and another one he's digging a grave. So looking at this thing, I linked it with a sermon preached by Charles Spurgeon 200 years before on the woman who lost her son and put the two together, and it's parallel. That's really kind of cool to see. So here's, the, here's another message that was given. I've done the Prattney modifications of it. But it was originally called Curious Cal uh, Calculations, Details Different but Equally Instructive. And I knew nobody would understand the fat what that meant, so I called it the law of the free lunch. Okay, here is the rules. Number one, there is more left when Jesus... You remember the story? There's two of them. Jesus feeds this bunch of people. So you can read it. If you get bored with this message, just read the thing. Uh, more left than the original lunch. Here's the strange thing. The remainder left after the feast was greater than when the banquet began. They began with five loaves and two fishes and seven loaves and a few fishes. These are these two different accounts. But they finished with 12 basketfuls in one case and with seven basketfuls in the other. They all did eat and were filled and yet there was more left than when they began. Now if you're going to feed suddenly you know, 5,000 people plus women and children. These are just the men. It's a huge crowd of people. You're going to feed them. You would think everybody gets, if you borrow some kid's lunch, everybody gets like one fish flake and one crumb from a hamburger bun. <laughs> That's it. But the Bible says, as they gave it out and gave it out, they all did eat and were filled. It's an amazing thing. How do you give this out and give this out and give this out and give this out and everybody's filled? But it doesn't end there. Jesus has the disciples pick up all the pieces. So this is what I believe. Some of you may come and you may ask God for something and he may tell you to leave whatever you're doing now. But then miracles happen and he will never waste anything. He will never waste anything. So if you feel like called to do something, and yet when God calls you, you're leaving something, and you think, well, what a waste of time that was to do all of that, to get ready for all that. God never wastes anything. Two. What if you haven't got it? Gone feeling, you were scantily supplied, but you have given them you all, and under the divine blessing, there's been enough for the crowd and a double portion for you. You went out with five loaves, and you came back with twelve basketfuls. We may so give for God as to get in the giving, to spend as to increase in the spending, so die for God as to live more than ever. 
There is a rule of the kingdom. It seems impossible, and yet it is the rule in the kingdom of grace. I have often found, Spurgeon said, when I have come with a very small stock to feed you, that I have gone away with more than I came with. Now, those of you who are involved in some kind of ministry, you understand that. You went thinking, I haven't got anything to say to these people. But by the time it's finished, not only are they touched, you've got more than when you came with. How, how many have ever had that kind of thing happen? You've got to share with somebody, you think, I don't even know what to say this, but they've got terrible situations. And then you find yourself saying stuff to them. You can't wait till they leave so you can write down what you just said because you never heard that before. So you come away with more than what you came with. You have been refreshed and I have been more full when I handed out your portion to you. What a wide field it opens to our hope and how it banishes our fear. It shuts the door of the accounting house where we calculate according to human reason. And it opens the door of the treasury whence we may draw ever-growing supplies. There is a, a thing that comes to the church, and it comes with many, many people. It is, I call it the accounting mentality. Now, those of you professional accountants, I'm not trying to burn you at the stake. I'm just saying this. We have a box sometimes that we put our whole lives into, and we are afraid of the edges of that box. And by the next few days, I hope I can show you something about God They'll show you why those boxes, without breaking his law, have this incredible edge. You stay on that edge, and it will continually grow. But if you cross the line, you die. And if you stay in the middle, you'll get boring. So I'm trying to get you to learn to surf the edge of the wave, which means every day will be a new adventure. Okay? And this will come because of the economy of the thing. See? All right, now, here's again. Go and scatter your handful of seed, for you shall come again rejoicing, bringing sheaves with you. Give of your meal and oil to the Lord's servant, and your barrel and cruise shall be replenished in the giving. Do you remember um, that lady? That Here's, here's the prophet, and he, he essentially says this. Thus saith the Lord, it's not going to rain. Then he leaves. Now, anybody can say that. He walk up the prison. Thus saith the Lord, it's not going to rain. But if it doesn't rain, after like a week, they'll, who was that masked man? You know, they're looking for you to take you out. But when you're out in the middle of nowhere, who is taking care of you? Here's the wild thing. There is water running when nobody else has it. And every day, God sends birds with meat sandwiches. Another encouragement to know you don't have to be vegan to serve the Lord. Those birds eat meat, but they didn't eat the sandwiches <laughs> that they had to bring. So every single day, he's provided for. And you would think this would go on forever. But this is what the Bible says. And then the brook dried up. And that's what you don't want. You don't want that brook to grow. You, you've fallen in love with the brook and the birds. And then, it's no longer a brook. You need to know this. When disaster happens in a nation, even if you're a Christian, you will be exposed to it. God will take care of you in the middle of it, but don't think you'll escape it. We think we'll get completely out of it. We'll all be, you know, swinging on chandeliers and singing hallelujah but everybody else is going to be suffering but that's all right because we're saved and they're not you you will feel a little bit of what your nation feels when the prophet spoke up about what god was doing he said we speaking i and this nation have sinned they took the place of the people a reckon not just a reconciliation but an identification with the nation that they are part of but what happens when the brook dries up? You've ever had that too? The brook suddenly dries up and the thing you've relied on for so long? Who was it that was talking about your job this morning? That you, you wasn't it? Where you just lost your job. When the brook dries up, it is freaky. You've had provision and it's gone on for a long, long time and now suddenly, it's like that, it's gone. 
And then the word comes to, to Elijah, go, there's a woman, and ask her for something to eat. Well, here's a woman who's, she's on her last meal. Her little boy is there, and they're making their last pancake, or whatever it is. And the prophet comes and says, the Lord sent me, in effect, I want something to eat. And they look at him like, are you crazy? And he's looking at himself, am I crazy? Here's a widow and a child. They haven't got this nothing, see that? But they do it. That's the amazing thing. They do it. And then he says to the widow, go and get pots. Get pots. Go and borrow from your neighbors. What if she didn't have any neighbors? What if she so hated her neighbors she never had any neighbors and she only had one pot? That's going to be dangerous. She got pots, 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 and the barrel will not empty, and the pot will still be filled, and day by day, God kept it right through that whole time of famine. So you will be part of the suffering in a way. But here's what David said, I have been young, and now I am old but I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. And I believe that's true. We trust him. We are not trusting the American government. We are not trusting the economy. We're not trusting the president. We're not trusting the Democratic or the Republican Party or the Green Party or any other party. We are trusting the one who made the world. And as long as that is true in our lives, we have somebody to lean on that has promised never to forsake us or fail us. And that I've seen again and again and again in our lives. Okay? Pilgrims, John Bunyan, there was a man and some did count him mad. The more he gave away, the more he had. The more he gave away, the more he had. God is prodigal in his provision, but economical in his conservation. You know, when God gives stuff, he gives a lot more than you would expect. You ask for something, and it suddenly it winds up, you think, well, I didn't, really, I didn't really expect this, and you get it, you see. You know what is embarrassing to, to people? Your neighbors know you didn't deserve that. See, if they win a lottery or something, and then they're broke in a year's time, <laughs> for some reason, and they see you and you're just ah, and you're having fun and stuff, and they think, why in the fat did you get that? I worked all my life to get this stinking thing, and I lost it in a day, so how do you get it? You don't deserve it. Don't go, yes, I do, because I am a man or woman of God. You shut up. Just say yes. It's true. You don't deserve it. We get it because of him, not because of us. Wasters of Satan, not of God. The Lord also is sufficient as yet the God of economy. Since Jesus could create as much food as ever he pleased, he might have thought it hardly worth his while to gather up the fragments, and yet he did so. God is lavish in creation, but not prodigal in miracles. Say, why not? Why doesn't miracles happen all the time? Why isn't it that every time you pray for people, they're immediately, utterly healed? Why is it you put a list in, plug in whatever you want to? Why is the miracle not the rule? The answer is that a miracle is the breaking of the rule. If there is a consequence to what you do wrong, the consequence in a cause and effect situation will always turn out that way. So if for some reason, genetics, screwed up, massive stress in our lives, something happens to our physical body, that is a consequence of something. Sometimes it's not our fault. Sometimes it's just screwed up things. We look at stress and wake and deal with things like that, massive things. Some of them. Well, if miracle becomes the rule, then the exception will be law. And you don't want to live in any culture or society where the exception is law. You don't want that to happen. 
because God's laws are descriptions of reality. Every time there's an intervention, it is a cutting off the consequence of a thing. So it will not always happen. Think of this. Jesus goes to some place and people aren't healed. He could do no mighty miracle in that area. Isn't that weird? He's God. Why can't he? Because there are rules. There are laws. And if there is violation in an area, sometimes not even God will overrule what he's already said. Okay? Don't, don't think it hard on God if things don't all happen the way we think they should. God is lavish in his creation, but not prodigal in miracles. What he would have us do is to make use of such powers as we have. What a wonderful thing this is. God, all-sufficient, owner of the cattle on a thousand hills, who could make a whole sea of fishes or 10,000 worlds of bread by his bare will and nothing else. Yet he sets his disciples to gather up the broken pieces that nothing may be lost. Let us be watchfully economical for the Lord. Got to go fast on these. Christ will take care of the broken. We must not allow ourselves to be thrown away or be consumed by an animal passion or to be left to decay. We must be in the Lord's store ready to be used when the time comes. We shall be of some use one of these days. You, my friend, are not a whole loaf. You're a crust. No crust may be wasted. If you're not a slice of bread, you are crumbs. Some of us are crumbs. We can tell. You look like a crumb. And even crumbs are dear to hungry men. If you're not a big fish, yet you may be a little fish. And you must not waste yourself, nor must the church of God allow you to be wasted. But use must be found for you somewhere, if we're willing to be used. The more you start with, the less is left over. Notice a curious thing. There is most left when there's least to begin with. See that? What is that? When they started the dinner with seven loaves, they gathered up seven basketfuls. But when they had only five loaves, they filled 12 basketfuls. So the less there is to start with, the more there is to finish. And when this larger amount here, you get a lesser amount at the end. The more they begin with, the less they end with. And the less they begin with, the more they have when the feast is concluded. I do not discover since Spurgeon the second set of baskets was any larger than the first. However, from a stock of seven loaves, after all expenditure, there came seven baskets as a remainder. But when there are only five loaves, a greater expenditure, there were 12 baskets full left for the waiters. This is singular. He's saying it's most unusual. The more they begin with, the less they end with. Now think of your lives. The more you begin with, the less you end with. The less you begin with, the more they have. The feast is finished. When you and I began rather grandly and God has blessed us, we have a great reason to thank him. But when we've begun very feebly, he has frequently blessed us far more and we have ended by praising him on the high sounding cymbals. Let the rich rejoice when he's brought low, for he like Job shall be richer than before. Do not begin to sink in spirit because you seem to have declined in ability, but just be confident in God that in your case also there will be most reward at the end when there was least capital to work with. Some of the less you have, the more God can do with you. Note again that with less visible means there's more done. Only five loaves, they fed 5,000. When there were seven loaves, they fed only 4,000. Most was done when there was less to do it with. So it shall happen, Spurgeon finishes, a worker for Jesus, for the more God blesses you, the less you shall see of any adequate reason in yourself why you should be blessed. And someone who had seven shall do less than you. With your five loaves, you shall feed your 5,000. And you will not save by cutting back on whom you serve. Suppose the larger our company, the less will remain, but here it seems that when the company was the largest and that which was left over was the largest, and when the company was fewer, then less was left. The more we have who come to draw from us spiritually, the more will remain for our own portion. 
we will not save by reducing the number of those whom we serve, but the reverse. Where there is the most work for Jesus, there will be the most remuneration. Not so elsewhere, for men are often paid best for doing least. But in our Lord's case, every man's reward shall be according to his service. So all of these things, finish this. Work for Christ, give for Christ, and labor for Christ. You shall have a rich return of present joy from him, and this shall have a portion in it. Poor people should give an order that they may not be poor any longer. And the rich should give that they may not become poor. I often wonder why God doesn't just take everybody off the poor list. But here's what he says. The poor shall be with you always. Dorothy Sayers, the friend of C.S. Lewis in those early days, said, always there will be poor, and the church's call is to minister to the poor. And if you take the love that our works that out of the equation, you'll have to replace it with something else like taxes. So when the church does its job, and I think George Bush, the previous thing, tried to do this for America, to open up, do you remember? To open up a way in which people could help other people, not, not out of a money-earning thing. And the first thing he did was with... Uh, and when he was governor of Texas, he opened the door for other things that weren't government-sponsored or govern all that. Remember that thing? That's a biblical truth. So we're, we're going to be in the middle of the thing. Things will happen to us. But right in the heart of that, our desire is to serve God. I'm going to boil all this down for you into two things. Putting together the Revival Study Bible uh, I wanted some kind of grid that I could sort the tens of thousands of people that could, could have been put in as contributors to this work. Thousands and thousands over these 2,000 years. So here's the thing. You won't see it in the Bible if you get it. It's a simple little grid. I wanted to find just not people, but a whole uh, blessing they were to other people and other people learning from what they did. So here's my... Th Here's my three things. Number one, whatever their background, wherever they came from, whether they have a long history of Christian things or total pagan or even anti-Christian, when they meet Jesus, like we talked about, when you see who Jesus is, he will show you who you are. When they see Jesus, they will love God till the day they die. They will love him with no other little things plugged in there. I love you until. I love you unless. I love you when. Take those little things out of that equation and just leave this. I will love you for the day I die. Isn't that the whole of the law? Isn't it all summed up by that? First one, love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And then the second one is like unto it. They will love people the same way. Whatever their background, wherever they come from, whatever's going wrong or right in their lives, you will love them the same way God loves you, namely without putting these little equations in there. I will love people. One of my prayers has been, and in speaking to quite large numbers sometimes, I've asked God through always these same things. God, I want to be real. I don't care uh, what kind of kids there are or anything else. I want to be real. They, they need to hear somebody who's telling them the truth, and I want to be real. I don't want to ever fake something or pretend something. I've got to tell them whatever the truth is. John Wesley stood up one time, and he said, I've had nothing from God. I have nothing to say to you. Go home. What a, what a, what a heart a man like that had. And the second one I've asked is that you will give me a touch from you that will show people they are loved by you. And the last one is that, and I'll, I'll put this, um, to be willing to die for the people you're talking to. 
that you would lay your life down to see them come. Moses said that. Paul said that. It's worth it. Jesus thought it was worth it. I think it's worth it. So here's this third one on that. Revival study Bible thing. It's a strange one. It says, I showed this, I talked to Michael about this. The third one is this, no knives under the table. You know what that is? I've seen people with a huge work, you know, that they love God and they love people. And then you're talking to them and then you mention something that is out of where they are, out of the box that they're ministering in. And then they go, oh, that person, or oh, oh, and they reach under the table, which is a beautiful table, and pull out a knife. The father doesn't have a knife under the table. He is the way he is. He loves us, whatever screwed up thing, he will do everything possible to save somebody. Can't change the rules. Can't change the consequences but he can step in because the law has three things it can't do. It cannot pardon somebody who screwed up. Only the judge can do that. It cannot justify what you did. And it cannot take you out of the punishment that comes. But there is somebody whose laws describe what is real, who is able to step in between the initiation and the consequence and to stop it with his hand. And that hand still has holes in it. Father, we thank you for what you've done again and again for us through history. We think now, Lord, of this nation and we think of the crises that come up. It seems stupid decisions being made at very high levels that walk completely out of what you say and what you called for. And, and many times we in your churches look and sometimes we're not sure how to even respond to things like that. But our trust is not in what is happening. Our trust is you. So we ask you to help us. We haven't come to you for a free lunch, but you're so good at giving other people who don't have one through a little boy or some 12 guys who don't even know what they're doing. Help us be like the little boy or like those guys. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.